Wasn't there a story about the gypsies? There was, yeah. The gypsies claimed to have seen him standing, waiting. It's where, where gypsies. And that's been a gypsy camp for over 100 years, this yeah. camp. So that's why I say we were here in the war. But my people all moved up that lane there with their wagons. Right. And that's why my, my father-in-law, and when, he was only 12 year old at the time, see that plane come down. There's a laneway goes up in there. They, they were coming down there when that plane come out of there, like, bang into here. God, and, and it was right here? Right here, literally. That's the uh, remains of the identity card. Everybody carried that little ID card. It was blue coloured card. Yeah. RAF crest on the front and that's the inside. And it's got a number. And it's got his number. 741587. Proof positive. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. A grateful family who'd been stonewalled by the ministry and a military funeral for a hero. Mark Kirby was convicted under the new law but given an absolute discharge because of the family's gratitude. Obviously I don't like breaking the law but I do like to see the families have the answers and when you've actually seen or met the family after one of these mysteries has been solved then you can, you can understand why, why it must be done. Mark uh, appeared on the door, or appeared on the doorstep, um, and I think he just literally, it just came out and he said, we found your brother, uh, to my dad, which obviously was great news. They sat on the arm, um, when I went to Jeff's house, one sat on one arm of the chair, and one sat on the other, and I showed them some photos, yeah. and all the bits and pieces that I'd got, <laughs> and they were just... And they said, thank you so much, because you've made our uncle uh, um, more famous now than he ever was in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. He's a real-life hero now. Yeah. And I always thought that was great. Which, obviously, was great news, but I think there was a certain moment where he wondered whether he had amnesia and he'd been wandering around, and I think those thoughts had all been going around in his head. But all these letters just show that my great-grandfather so desperately wanted, oh. so desperately wanted his body to be recovered. Well, and this was the thing, this was the conversation I had with your gran on mm. the telephone, because her initial reaction was no, you see, Nick. So I'd asked Dad about his dad and how this was, you know, and he was saying it was the one thing he really wanted to happen before he died. Yeah. And he was, as he'd said on the, the video, that he would have been so thrilled. As it turned out, um, he was exonerated from uh, his actions. And if my father being alive, he'd been mentally happy. It's just like saying goodbye to a, to a two-year-old sort of close friendship with him. So I think he thought he was doing the right thing and Mum was standing by him, just supporting him. Because it was a bit of a shock, this guy turning up on the doorstep saying, we found your brother. All those years thinking possibly he had been wandering around with amnesia. That was one of the thoughts, because nothing had been found. Of course, there was always a thought that maybe he parachuted, maybe he hit his head and he had amnesia. So for somebody to turn up at the door, as nice as Mark was, it was a shock. And I just said to her, look, the only thing I can say is that I'm pretty sure I've got all the correspondence that you let the Tangier Museum have, and they've passed it all on to me. And I'm pretty sure by reading through that he was desperate mm. to know what had happened to him. He was desperate to, to have him recovered. I think it was just for him. For Dad it was closure. And I don't think he ever thought that anybody would disagree with the idea of actually him having a proper burial. I think to him it didn't even, it didn't even come into it. And uh, she said, do you know something? You're, she said, "What worries me is that it won't happen, and that that will that will 
um, cause heartache in the family. But yeah. had he said at any point, if he's ever discovered this is what I want to happen, there could have been a complete end to all this and it would have been a lot easier, I think, to, to swallow. But, you know, even for Margaret, it, would have, it must have been hard to, yeah. to suddenly realise that your, your brother has been found. Mm. And I said, but if I can guarantee I can recover it and do it properly, you know, well, does that make any difference? And she said, look, you're right what you say. My dad did want John recovered. And I suppose it's only right that I should respect that mm -hmm. now. And all I would say to you is, please look after him. Missing in action, resting in peace. D do you think they should have rested in peace? No, I, I, I think I think they should have rested in peace. But I think that um, you know, I mean, in my book there, it quotes the Church of England. I think saying that the basic right of every man is to have a decent burial. Uh, and this is something they certainly haven't had, and, and I think it's appalling that when, you know, the Ministry of Defence has known, what it, you know, where the, the, these aircraft have crashed for years and have been presented with evidence and they have steadfastly resisted and refused to excavate these sites, you know, I think that is wrong. More than 40 years after the Battle of Britain, the Protection of Military Remains Act 1986 made it a criminal offence to dig on a wartime wreck, body or no bodies, without a licence. The author of the private bill was Michael Mates, MP. At that time, there were a number of military archaeologists, and there's nothing wrong with that, who were digging up sites where it was known that there were dead bodies. And what we wanted to do was to regulate this, not totally prevent it, but prevent it being done just in the cause of uh, looking for remains of aeroplanes and ships. So you, you apply for a licence, and then they grant it if there's nothing, if they... Um, are satisfied there's nothing there. So there's no point in, gra in applying for a licence if you know it's not going to be granted. Mm -hmm. Because if I'd have applied for it, they would have then contacted the landowner and then told the landowner, if you let this chap um, carry out this dig on the land, we're going to prosecute you. Oh, God. So I bypassed it. So you used to work for Jimmy Stewart? Yep. Uh, I've heard a backstory about a, a airplane crashing and that. And or knew that he wasn't happy about someone being dug up in the, yeah. out in the field. So, you know, it's got nothing to do with your family or it's just what people believe in. So. The sort of uh, recovering of, you know, artefacts from crash sites connected with Battle of Britain aircraft and things, you know, gave you a tangible link with the past, something that um, that, that was unique, really. Uh, and it was, a, it was a way of of literally reaching out and touching the past. It's not treasure hunting at all, and uh, and I think that um, you know the, the feelings of the family and and the uh, the sacrifice that was made by these pilots it is the paramount thing that that drives and, uh, and and sort of inspires, if you like, the people that are involved in this. The story of the recovery, because that was um, you know quite quite a landmark case, wasn't it, at the time with the legalities that went on behind it and so on and so forth. So. Um, so certainly from that side of it, it was it was interesting. But uh, I've learned much more about your great uncle this evening, browsing through his logbook, which he very kindly showed me. I had no idea that he he saw so much action, and I think that's um, remarkable logbook you've got there. Water took about half an hour to to get in once we'd broken through that bottom, and it mm. just seeped up from the river, and we had to be quick then. Mm. But we'd pretty much done it. The engines there in this picture so we it was down in here we just pulled it out to one side because this all started to filter up mm -hmm. and what we did once we got that wreckage out we done it pretty quickly and then we we took this whole area out through the water and put it out on the top and then we took water out of the river mm -hmm. and washed the soil through oh, okay. and went through it with our fingers and we all lined across every member went across and, and went right across it and picked out every last little bit, and then once that was done, it was scraped back in the hole. Oh, That's okay. how fine we went through it. There's the engine. Okay. That's what I stood next to in the uh, in the museum. That's it. Look at the quality of the pistons on the inside. Mm. No, it's uh, in remarkably good condition. Rolls Royce, British made. Yeah, it is. Built to last. <laughs> 
this is wood. This, this is, is like here, a, a wooden propeller blades. Yeah. They would be on here. Yeah. This, this is straight this off is, here. That's you've got your three. Oh, this is the actual nose. Blades. That's, that's like a like a trunk of a tree. <laughs> So During the recovery operation, Sergeant Gilder's parachute was found in near perfect condition. As you can see in these two photographs, it could still be inflated. Today, one of the few was finally laid to rest more than 50 years after his death. It marks the end of a remarkable detective story. Phil Bales reports from Brookwood in Surrey. For more than 50 years, he and the mystery of his death lay buried in a field in Kent. 22-year-old Sergeant John Gilder's Spitfire had exploded on impact. He'd been engaged to Molly Nicholson for just a few days. His family believed the plane had crashed in the sea. His father wouldn't give up hope that the son who'd shot down three enemy planes had parachuted to safety. It wasn't until years later that Mark Kirby discovered from the official records where it had really crashed and with the relative support recovered John Gilder's remains. I think there was you know, a lump in the throat on every man, with every man that was there, really. Um, very emotional. Mark Kirby made today's funeral with full military honours possible, but he paid a price. He was arrested for not asking the MOD for permission. He says if he had, it would have been refused. I really did take, take it into my own hands to, to see to it that he would definitely get that funeral, and that was the way it was going to be done. Despite their opposition, the MOD today laid John Gilders to rest. A young man breaking the law had delighted the war hero's brother. As it turned out, um, he was exonerated from uh, his actions. If my father being alive, he be eventually happy. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. saying goodbye to a to a two-year-old sort of close friendship with him.